Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I am a third year PhD student at Yale University, a content creator and business owner. Today we're talking about my very exciting move to London. I have been wanting to move to the UK for so long and I'm really excited to do this little Q&A with you. I haven't done a real sit down video in forever and I haven't really done this type of Q&A style other than, for example, like on Instagram stories, which by the way, if you're not following me on Instagram, you definitely should. We're gonna jump right into it. We've got questions about money. We've got questions about visas. We've got questions about my dog and where I'm gonna be living in London. So if you want to know all of the juicy details about my move to the UK, then go ahead and keep on watching. I went ahead and put my hair up into a ponytail so that way I don't get makeup all over it. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with foundation and the first question, which is why am I moving? There's a lot of confusion as to why I would need to move during my PhD. The answer is that I'm getting my PhD in history and the sources that I use for my research are archives. My project looks at the social and legal histories of Black women across the 17th century English Atlantic. A lot of the women that I'm looking at lived in places like Bristol, London, Kent in the late 16th and early 17th century. And then I'm also looking at the archival records for the colonies of Barbados and Virginia. While I may need to go look at some records in Virginia, actually, I most certainly am going to need to go look at records in Virginia, a lot of my archival sources are going to be based here in London or around the UK. So the regional archives that I need to visit are going to be all around the UK, but most of my colonial records that I'm going to need to access are going to be at the National Archives or at the various archives around London. I'm going to need to go to Oxford for a little while. I believe I might have to go up to Cambridge but I shouldn't have to go too far. And so that's why it makes the most sense for me to be based in London. In all fairness, I could probably do the archival research that I need to do in about six to eight months. I would need to do most of it here, but I am essentially trying to extend my time in the UK because I like being in the UK. The way that it works with my PhD, you have two years of coursework, then you have in your third year, you begin teaching, you're meant to pass your comprehensive exams, you defend your prospectus, and then in your fourth year, you're meant to either be on fellowship or on the University Dissertation Fellowship, also known as the UDF, in order to have funds to go abroad. I am currently in the process of applying to fellowships. I've applied for a few, and one of the fellowships that is native to Yale as a university is the Macmillan. And so only Yale graduate students can apply to the Macmillan. It is specifically for international research related to your dissertation. And so the plan is essentially that I will either be using fellowship funding, hopefully from the Macmillan, a combination of fellowships from various places because I applied to a couple different ones and it's never guaranteed that you'll actually get what you apply for. Actually, it's very rare that you get what you apply for. So you have to really cast a wide net. It feels almost like applying to graduate school again. You use that funding to support yourself and that is what replaces the stipend because if you make over a certain amount in fellowships and grants, then you lose the living stipend portion of your funding from Yale. The thing about the UDF is that the UDF can be used for either the writing stage of your dissertation or it can be used for the research phase of your dissertation. In an ideal world, you will not use the UDF until you are writing the dissertation. And there are dissertation writing fellowships, but most fellowships relate to actually going to archives. I'll talk a little bit about my plans in the long run in a second, because I think that's important, but essentially I'm moving to the UK as part of my PhD. I am not leaving my PhD program. This is part 
of the process. In all fairness, there are much less expensive ways to navigate the dissertation phase. For example, my project originally was based largely in the United States, and that would have been a much less challenging process in terms of visas, in terms of money, in terms of logistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the project that I'm interested in and have proposed and um, hopefully defending and getting the approval of my committee very soon is based on UK archives. And so I will be here for a minimum of a year. Now I want to talk a little bit about the rest of my PhD and what that looks like because people were curious about timeline. Do I have to return to Yale? Am I going to be staying in the UK for how long? I would love to stay in the UK indefinitely. However, there are various factors at play that are just outside of my control and I won't have a whole lot of agency in deciding how that goes. For example, I will be on either a fellowship or a UDF and that really determines what funding I have available to me the following year. So I'm hoping I don't have to use the UDF next year. I'm hoping that the Macmillan will come through and then I can live off of that as my living stipend. But if I don't, then I'll be using the UDF and that gives me a year and then I will have to apply for funding to stay in the UK or I will have to go back to Yale in order to get paid. The way that it essentially works is that if you are not on UDF, then you're on a teaching fellowship. And so if you want to continue getting paid and to remain in your PhD program, you either need to find external funding or you need to return to Yale and teach while working on your dissertation. Ultimately, I would prefer not to live in New Haven again. I love my apartment. I have a couple really close friends, but I just don't really feel part of the community there. I don't have a strong connection to the history department. I think this is partially due to the pandemic and also partially due to having set up communities outside of Yale. That meant that I did not personally invest a lot of time in developing friendships at Yale, which is on me, but I would prefer not to have to return to New Haven. And so my plan is if I do have to go back to Yale to teach, I will likely move somewhere near New Haven, somewhere that I can travel into. I think I'd probably live in one of the other cities that is connected by train to New Haven. I don't think I would live in New York. I don't think I can afford to live in Boston. We will see. My plan is hopefully that I will, in a perfect world, get a fellowship for the next year, get the UDF for my fifth year, and then hopefully in my sixth year, I will either get a writing dissertation fellowship or I will go back to the United States for one of the other fellowships that are closer to the DC area. So there are dissertation writing fellowships, for example, through ASLH, so the Legal History Association or the Association for British Studies. There's also the Philadelphia Philosophical Society and other types of fellowships that are in Philadelphia, such as the McNeil, I believe. And then there's also things like fellowships at William and Mary and things of that nature that would make a lot of sense for my project. And so if I do go back to the States, I'm hoping that I will likely be in DC. It's essentially up in the air and I'm not entirely sure. So we're gonna find out together. I will be in the UK for a minimum of a year, if not two years. And then I'm hoping to find a way to stay here for all three of the remaining years of my PhD and to hopefully remain in the UK after my PhD. But you know, things change. My life has changed a lot in the last three years. I have changed careers. I have changed research topics. I have entirely changed plans. I've changed my relationship status. So who knows? <laughs> Another question that I got a lot of was how am I affording the move? And oh boy, let's, let's get into it. It is quite common for PhD students in history to need to go away to go do research. This is, this is something that is well known. And luckily there are schools like Yale that if you get in and you are a PhD student there, they have funding to help you go abroad. Almost everybody in my program, except for the Americanists, has to go abroad for their research. So for example, there's one person in my program who I believe is currently in Ethiopia. There's another person in my program who I believe is in China or Taiwan at the moment. And so traveling for research is kind of part of the PhD process, especially 
in the humanities, even in AFAM, where I am getting my joint degree. So everybody's project looks a little bit different, but we all have to essentially travel to collect sources, to do interviews, to perform ethnographic work. And so it, it varies depending on what your path is. That being said, the move to the UK and especially to London is mighty expensive. And I'm going to be perfectly frank, while I could still do this because of the UDF and because of fellowship funding, I am doing so significantly because I have been saving YouTube money in order to pay, for example, the visa fees and other things of that nature. I'm going to talk about visas in a minute, but essentially a lot of what US nationals will do is come to the UK for only six months in order to do their research, because then you can come on a visitor visa, which is at no extra cost, at least right now. I believe that policy is gonna be changing in the next year or two. Essentially, you can be here for six months without paying for a visa. However, because I plan on remaining for longer than six months, I have a slightly different situation, which means that I'm going to have to pay for a very expensive visa which I have been saving for because it is significantly expensive. So you have to pay, for example, the NHS surcharge, which is, I believe, like 650 quid. And then visa fees vary. Sometimes it could be over a thousand. So I have been saving for that. There's a couple different ways that I've been doing that, but mostly it's YouTube money, to be honest. I get a lot of questions about, for example, how it is that I afford my apartment and all of that. And the thing is that a lot of the things that I get to do as a PhD student are not normal. And I acknowledge that I have a very incredibly privileged, li privileged lifestyle. And that is because of YouTube. The comfort of the move is made possible because of YouTube, because of these videos that you are watching and because of the brand deals that I do. I would love to make more videos on finance. I'm a little hesitant to do so just because I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about how YouTube actually works and how much you can make on YouTube. But the short answer is that the way I'm able to afford this move is one, because of the fellowships that are offered by Yale, which are quite generous. And also because I have additional income that is a bit of a cushion, which comes from creating content on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And now let's talk about where I will be living. So. As you can tell, I am in my partner's flat here in London. We started dating eight months ago, and so I've been staying with him when I came back in November and then this time here. The question that I got a lot was, are we gonna be moving in together? And the answer is no, but I will be staying with him for the first month or two while I am finding a place in London. I think it's important that we live apart. I think it's important for me to develop community outside of our relationship, which is still quite new. And also because I just want to experience London on my own a little bit. I really loved being here last summer. Yale paid for me to be here last summer. I got a short-term grant that paid for my trip to London last year. I really enjoyed that independence and being able to navigate the city on my own. And while obviously we will see a lot of each other, I still want to be able to experience the city in developing my life here a little bit on my own. I will ideally be living in a studio. At the moment, I am honestly paying a lot more in rent than I feel comfortable with. I made my move into my current apartment because I could afford to do so, but if I'm actually honest, it was a bit of an irresponsible move financially. I wish I had been saving more money and it is a cause of stress. What I'm trying to do is find a smaller flat or a shared living situation. And so in an ideal world, I'm hoping to actually find a roommate. I also like the idea of being able to develop a bit of a community and some friendships. And one way of doing that is by having a roommate. I will only do that if it's somebody that I know and that I trust and that I think we would get along. And so I'm not pressed to make it happen, but if a situation came along where it felt like the right fit and someone was living in London, and they would be willing to live with me and my my tiny dog, then I would be open to the idea of splitting a place because honestly, I just, I wanna save a little bit of money. I have been a lot more cautious with my finances as of late. 
I was a little bit frivolous last year, especially because I got basically two really big brand deals that made it possible for me to, for example, like buy nice furniture. I will not be able to do that when I move to London. I'm going to try to be a little bit more frugal, which sounds kind of counterintuitive when moving to one of the largest cities in the world. Actually, if you look at how much it costs to live here versus in the United States, the living expenses are not that dissimilar, at least because I came from California and I have lived in rather expensive areas. But the reason is that I make more in US currency than I would if I were working, for example, for a company in the UK or if I were a student in the UK. And so that contributes significantly to my, my options and my flexibility. Short answer is I am hoping to find a studio apartment. I am thinking I'm probably gonna stay either in the east of London or the northwest of London. I am going to be doing a bunch of apartment videos, apartment hunting videos for you to watch along for the process because I love watching them. We'll see where I end up. The next question is about visas and which visa I will be on. I have a friend, her name is Blair, and she has been in a couple of my videos in the past, but she moved to London last year and she came as an exchange student to UCL. So UCL and Yale have a relationship where you can basically work with one of their professors while you're here and you can also get a student visa in order to come over to the UK. So that was an option. I ultimately decided not to go that route, mostly because I couldn't really find anybody at UCL or at Royal Holloway that seemed like a good fit for me and for my project. And because I knew that there were other visa options available, and also because I would like to create content in the UK. Ideally would like to make income off of brand deals and whatnot still. And so I wanted a visa that would have flexibility for me to actually develop income here in the UK and try to set up residency. We'll see how that goes. And so I looked at a couple different visa options. There are ones where, for example, as a US citizen, you can apply to stay for up to 12 months. So I looked at that option and ultimately decided that wasn't quite what I wanted because that's basically a visitor's visa. And I was really reluctant to apply to the, this particular visa, but the one that I'm going to be applying for is the high potential individual visa. The high potential individual or HPI visa is a new visa that came out, I believe in 2021. It essentially has a list of schools from the US and I believe other countries as well that are on this list of if you graduated from those schools in the last five years and you can have proof that you graduated from those schools, then you are eligible for this particular visa. It is a significant privilege based on the fact that I went to UCLA that I'm actually able to access this visa. It is the one that will allow me to stay in the UK for two years. It'll allow me to work and hopefully build my businesses here in the UK and also offers a path to residency and eventual citizenship if that's the route that we're going. I'm not sure. My plan is to be here one to two years and then see if remaining here in the long term is what I want. Because I changed my mind like a year ago or two years ago, I would have said that I wanted to live in DC. That obviously changed. So there's definitely some room for flexibility. I am not entirely sure what my long-term plan is gonna be, but at the moment, it looks like I am going to be staying in the UK. I would be remiss to not mention that part of my reason for wanting to stay in the UK is because of my research and because I see the future of my research beyond my dissertation being in the UK archives. Secondly, I have a lot of community here. A lot of my friends are here. Chanel and Kate are gonna be going to Oxford and also my partner's here. So there are many reasons why I wanna be in the UK. I 
I've always wanted to live in the UK, at least for a stint. And Oxford was my opportunity to do that, but then COVID happened. And so I didn't get to stay for the entire year. And I'm just excited to be back in the UK and to have this opportunity. I feel quite self-conscious about using the HPI. I keep basically calling it the nepotism visa because it, it restricts who has access based on incredibly elitist values. However, it is a pathway for me to get a visa to stay here for a year or two. And it's the one that makes the most sense based on the parameters. And so while there are other options, for example, doing an exchange and getting a student visa, the HPI is the one that makes the most sense. However, it is not cheap. It is incredibly expensive. So that's another thing I'm gonna have to deal with. What about Moo? Is Moo coming with me? So as many of you know, I have my little dog Moo and I cannot imagine life without her. She lived with my mom while I was in college and when I was getting my master's at Oxford. By that point, I, ha I wasn't used to living with her, just the two of us. It wasn't as noticeable that when she wasn't around, but I can't live without her. And so she is coming with me. It's going to be an absolute process and it is an incredibly expensive process. So the way that I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna be flying into the EU. So I'm gonna fly into Ireland at the end of May and I'm gonna be staying with my friend Kate who also works for Accepted. And the reason that we thought that this would be the best option is because you can fly into Paris or Amsterdam, but getting to the UK is just so incredibly challenging. If that's the route that you decide to take, Moo would need to get a pill for tapeworm, I believe, about five days before entering the UK. It just sounded like a really difficult process to try to get her to the vet like two days before I fly to Dublin and so we're going to go to Dublin. We're gonna see the vet that Kate takes her dogs to, Moo's gonna get her pill, and then we're gonna take the ferry across to the UK. So it's going to be a mighty fine process. I'm gonna make a lot of content about it because I have watched YouTube videos and TikToks and everything I can find about taking your dog with you to the UK. It is really difficult. It's it's a really annoying process, but I will be having Moo coming with me. So I'm really excited to have her here. I think she's gonna enjoy London. I don't think she's gonna like the underground, but I'm hoping that we can move to an area of London where there's at least a little bit of greenery. So that way I could take her on walks. I have this like really magical rosy image of us going for morning walks at Hyde Park but the idea of being able to live in West London just seems not feasible so I'm hoping that we can find a place like up in Hampstead or something where I have access to take her to a nice park. And then the last question is what am I going to do with my apartment in New Haven? So I'm moving out. I'm moving out at the end of May. It is bittersweet. I love that apartment. It is my dream apartment. To be honest I can't entirely afford it. I have made it happen. I have made sure that I made enough with YouTube and whatnot to make it feasible for me to stay in that apartment. But if I move back to New Haven, I will be moving to a much less expensive living arrangement. That's my plan at the moment at least, or I would be moving to an area just outside of New Haven where hopefully it's a little less expensive. I'm gonna be selling a lot of my stuff actually. So I'm gonna keep a couple key furniture pieces just in case I do end up having to go back to the US. I am going to keep my TV, I'm gonna keep one of my TV consoles and my couch. Most of the rest of it I'm gonna sell. Almost all of the tech gear that is on my desk at the moment, my monitors and all of that I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna sell my desk. I'm probably gonna keep the desk chair just because the desk chair is so expensive. I love my desk, but it is easily replaceable. And also it is huge. And if I moved into a different space when I get back and it needs to be smaller than that, that desk just won't work. And so I'm gonna be selling that, I'm selling the bookcases, I'm selling my chair, selling my bed, my mattress. I'm selling a lot of it. I'm selling almost everything. Then I'm gonna keep my books. Those are really important to me that I keep and I'm gonna be putting those in storage. I had thought about basically selling actually all of it, but I don't want to be in a position where I have sold everything and then I have to go back to the US and I have nothing and I have to refurnish. Whereas it's a lot easier to get a furnished place here in the UK. It's not so easy to do so in the US and I needed that flexibility. So I'm going to be putting a lot of it in storage. I'm going to be selling a lot of it. The apartment, I will be moving out of it at the end of May 
and they already have a tenant selected for it. I've gotten a lot of questions about my building. I personally would not recommend my building. I've had a lot of issues with it. My friend Sarah, who lives very close to me, we live in the same building. She has had tremendous issues with the building. And so I am gonna be doing an apartment tour, but I am not recommending the building that I've been staying in just because it has quite a few issues that I would not recommend. And I don't think it's worth it to pay that much money for an apartment building that has so many problems. I'm really excited for the next chapter. Moving to London and getting to see my relationship develop, develop friendships, hang out with Jazz and Blair and other people in the city, seeing Elizabeth more often, which I'm really excited about. I really have enjoyed my life in New Haven and the life that I've built with my, my little Moosef. It is kind of bittersweet, but I'm really excited for this next chapter and I'm excited to move my channel in a different direction. I have been feeling a little limited by making PhD content as someone who doesn't want to unethically promote graduate school when it's not the right path for everybody. I want to be able to make content about other things and other things about my life. I want to make a lot more content about entrepreneurship. I have a lot to say on the matter and a lot of content that I'm excited to make here in London. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and end off the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, remember to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye everyone.